man. All right. So listen, Monster Market here. I want to first off say thank you for coming in on such short notice. Ben called out and I'm glad that you could pinch hit today. Well, I'm always glad to be your second choice, Zach. <laughs> it's only because Ben's walking the earth. I know. It's only because Ben's not here. <laughs> it's only because Ben's not here. No, that, uh, look, look. Look, Zach, one day you'll realize two. I'm the good looking girl next door who doesn't try to look good. And I've been here the whole time while you're chasing you saying, after Ben. Are you saying that you're Betty to Ben's Veronica? That's exactly right. right. <laughs> I'm Boo well, from Teen Wolf. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that, you know, if we want to make this seem a little better we should give you a special name so rather than you know like oh your second choice why don't we call you something like super deuce <laughs> that was that was my uh nickname on track and field <laughs> that was a long distance runner and you know you know what happens you shake up the bowels <laughs> I've, I've heard that i've heard that i've heard that that's why i don't run <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I am here with my 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 safety net, my number two choice. Yeah. Jersey. Hey. Hey Zach. I'm glad. No, I'm I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad. I that know. You're here. I know. There, there, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that you love me, and that is why I was having fun. That was good old super deuce. Good old super deuce. <laughs> oh no, that's gonna take <laughs> the big <laughs> the big number two himself. All right. <laughs> God bless it. <laughs> I like how you added in that bless real quick. You just you slid that in. Well, it's God a, bless it. It's a, it's a clean show. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, mostly that's true. We've got you know we've got kids and grandmas listening. That's, that's right. We got kids, kids and grandmas listening. Well, that, we don't want to upset the kids and grandmas. I've seen the market data. You are big with grandmas. It's it's it's, it's, it's those <laughs> cheeks, it's just so pinchable. Okay, mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. joking around. We got to talk about monsters, right? Yeah, this is serious. This is serious. <laughs> All right, so uh, our theme today, you know, we have a theme for every episode. And today, our theme is we're talking about literary monsters or monsters that come from a specific story or a specific source. Mm. Um, and I know that you have read a few books in your day. I have, and yeah. You enjoy story and narrative. Um, I love them. So I say, why don't we just get right to it? So I have my monsters, and I know you have your monsters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing is, is Ben is the keeper of the coin. So oh. I do not have I do not have the coin. Oh, no. But any dungeon master worth his salt never goes <laughs> anywhere without a 20-sided die. Oh, excellent. So... I would like you to pick a number mm -hmm. from one to ten. Okay. And if it's if it's between one and ten, you get to choose. If it's between eleven and twenty, I get to choose. All right. Okay. So, all right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to roll my trusty die, and it's a five. So I get to choose. Yes, not a good hit in Dungeons and Dragons, but a great hit if you get to choose uh, <laughs> who goes first in this episode of The Monster Market. That's true, yes. I think in real life, if I ever tried to actually hit somebody, I would roll a two to a five. It would, it would be like I would just graze their shoulder and they would look at me like, what were you trying to do? Mm. But mm -hmm. so this, this feels true to life to me. Um, okay, so I choose you, Pikachu. I want you to go and I want to hear what monster you're bringing to, from, from the written word. The first monster I'm going to talk about today, I'm actually, I'm going to start mm. off, I think, strong. I'm going to talk about the big M effer mm. right here. Whoa. So, all right, a couple of, a couple of, couple of names for you. I want to know if you have heard any of these before. Uh, Night Goer. No. Shadow Walker. No. The Mark Stepper. No, but I'm scared. <laughs> you should be. Also called a Jotun. Also sometimes called a Troll okay. or an Ogre. Mm. I'm talking about... The world's most famous mama's boy, <laughs> Grendel. Oh. 
Are you familiar with Grendel? I, I not not the not not the comic from the nineties. Right, right. Not Hunter Rose. No. Um, <laughs> I read Beowulf in high school for my um English lit class, and I don't remember Same much here. except that there was a campfire and a lot of guys got et. I, am I remembering that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. So, OK, so just a little bit of background on you already mentioned Beowulf. So uh, Grendel appears in Beowulf. Beowulf is one of the oldest um, English, old English epic poems that that we have. Um, mm. We don't know exactly when it it, you know, started being told, but we do have ancient manuscripts that date from somewhere between 700 to like 1000 uh AD or CE mm. um and this you know manuscript is one of the reasons why we know this poem as well as we do and this is a poem that has been translated hundreds of times by hundreds of authors uh notably a one Mr J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, wow. And when you read it, when you read the poem, uh, you can definitely see Beowulf's influence on his work. I mean, first of all, I even think, like I said, names like Shadow Walker and Mark Stepper, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I can see those as, you know, Tolkien-esque names. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Barrel Rider. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so by, by way of just a quick synopsis. So Beowulf is the hero of Geatland. Now, uh, that's the Geats, Geatland. That's uh, what is we would know as sort of the southern part of modern Sweden. So this is the part of the world that we're in. We're in basically like Scandinavia, northern Germany, Sweden, that that area. Beowulf is this hero who hears that uh, King Hrothgar, who is a Danish king, is having some trouble. And so he asks, Beowulf asks his own king if he can go and help Hrothgar. So he goes down there, and the problem is that Hrothgar has built this huge hall, this huge mead hall. And again, if you want to take it back to Tolkien, you can basically imagine Rohan. This is basically Rohan, okay. the Rohirrim, yep. right? Like that big hall, and they all kind of eat and sleep there, right. everything. So um, ever since he built this, ever since King Hrothgar built this hall, this monster named Grendel, who does not, according to the poem, does not like joyous sounds, has been attacking the hall and, and eating his, his men while they sleep. And there seems to be nothing they can do. So Beowulf says that he is going to help. So what he does is uh, one night, everyone is partying and they go to sleep and Beowulf pretends to be asleep. And sure enough, when Grendel attacks, Beowulf uh, uh, springs forward and fights Grendel. And no weapons, nothing can, can seem to penetrate or pierce Grendel's hide and they fight viciously in the hall until Beowulf manages to grab Grendel's arm and rip it off at the shoulder mm. and it's at this point that Grendel flees into the night and in the morning Beowulf manages to track him down and has found that Grendel is dead in the marshes uh, because of his wounds and Beowulf like displays the arm you know like like hey here's the arm now, that's actually only the beginning of the story. So despite Grendel being uh, this iconic monster, um, he bites it in the first act. Mm. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Grendel in particular. Grendel is a little short on description, um, although some of that also comes from there's a lot of scholarly debate because it also depends on who's translating it and how they're interpreting what is being said about Grendel. You know, is this is, you know, is the stuff being said about Grendel meant to be literal or figurative? But things that we do know about Grendel is that he is humanoid. He he walks on two legs. 
um, but he is greater than a man, meaning he's he's larger. So he's he he may look human, but he's not human. Um, he's definitely monstrous. Sometimes uh, he's described as um, like he's described as like a night beast, and sometimes you know, like for example, he's described as possibly having horns or spikes or spurs. Um, but that could, again, that could be a lot of people sort of accept that that's maybe just a, a, a poetic description of his his rough, rough skin. Um, the other thing that is generally agreed upon is that Grendel seems to be descended from the biblical Cain. Oh. So the idea is that, you know, the, these descendants of Cain are sort of these monstrous, demonic creatures. And Grendel happens to be uh, of that that bloodline. Different translators have sort of speculated, you know, is Grendel wearing armor? Does he just have tough skin? You know, all of this kind of stuff. But like I said, you can generally just sort of imagine that Grendel is kind of what we would conceive as like an ogre, something like that. So, I mean, not a Shrek ogre, but like an actual like scary <laughs> An actual scary ogre, because uh, because Grendel is also always said as um, he doesn't just go in and kill Hrothgar's men; he eats them, right? You know, and he 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 takes he takes joy in that. <laughs> um, now, I called Grendel the ultimate mama's boy. So why did I do that? Yeah, because if you're not familiar with the story, the next thing that Beowulf does after killing Grendel is he learns about Grendel's mother and dispatches her as well. Um, and then there's also a dragon in there. Um, but one of the things that is sort of, again, interesting about Grendel is he's really this iconic monster in that his, like I said, where his description is a little vague, he really kind of represents like this unknown fear but also again this sort of somewhat manlike fear so it's 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 like us but not like us yeah um he's also something that's completely unreasonable right like you're not going to sit down and go whoa grendel let's talk this out <laughs> <laughs> um and 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 the other thing too that's interesting is because he lives in the marshes and i think i think he generally lives in a cave underwater because that's where his mother lives. Um, but it's been pointed out that, you know, water as a barrier between worlds. So again, Grendel sort of representative of from another place, from somewhere, you know, different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and and sort of the the scary take on that. Right. So that's really... That's Grendel. That's that's a lot of what I have to say about that. Uh, two quick factoids I wanted to share. Um, again, bringing it back to Tolkien. Uh, now, obviously, Tolkien was not the first translator of Beowulf, um, but he did do a, a, a fairly well-known translation and, and uh, analysis of the poem. Um, but uh, Beowulf is one of the first poems where we see the word orc really English. yeah yeah um and it's a little bit again it's it's a little bit vague it's just sort of descriptive of like a malevolent spirit but it does have some connection with with that poem and when you think about it too orc is similar to like ogre like it's it's got some of the same dna in it mm -hmm. um and then finally, I found this really fascinating. Uh, so we're talking about Grendel. We're not talking about Beowulf, but I do want to talk about Beowulf just for one second. So Beowulf, the name, means bee wolf. Hmm? And try to think, if you were an ancient Scandinavian, what is, what is a creature that you could potentially describe as a bee wolf? A bee wolf? Like, I don't understand what that means. Like a bee, like like a buzz, buzz. Oh, a, a buzz and a wolf. Oh, what would it be? Oh, there'd be a tiger. No, there's no tigers in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Dummy. 
Well, that's what I thought about about a bear? You, oh, a bear. I said, but bears don't have bee stripes. That, that, I was thinking of the stripes. Uh, <laughs> no, but they eat bees. Oh, oh! I I was mixing the animals together into like a composite clone in my head, like a wuzzle. <laughs> yes, yeah, like a wuzzle. You were making a wuzzle. Yes, <laughs> Beowulf is the first wuzzle. He's Bumble Lion. That's right. Oh my god! <laughs> there, we got our silly uh, monster into the mix now. Yes, okay. There it is. So, so Beowulf is a bear. Well, he's not a bear, but he his his name is evocative of of a bear. bear. Right. He's yeah. He's summoning the archetypal energy of the bear into his way. He shows up as a hero. Right. Um. And in fact, there are even some translators that uh, I think they're in the minority, but they sort of speculate that maybe Grendel is representative of a berserker. Hmm. Mm. Which I mean, um, they they did like wear like animal skins over their bodies, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And they were, by all accounts, you know, so wild and difficult to deal with that um you know yeah who knows mm. who knows um but so that is grendel kind of the archetypal i think for the english speaking world um monster ogre you know i that just kind of thing they kind of all stem from grendel i'd like to read some analysis on this just to find out what people think about ripping the arm off because like you, you mentioned he's got like unbreakable skin. I'm like, okay, Nemean lion, he's gonna choke it to death. Nope, he rips its arm off, mm -hmm. right? And the arm's yeah. the trophy. Well, the arm is like, I don't know, it's it's like the, the it's the thing that has the claws in the end of it. It's the thing that that gives a creature agency. I wonder I don't know. I don't I I'm 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 doing totally armchair uneducated sort of analysis of that, but I do wonder like what people have thought about in terms of that method of death for for the monster. Well, and, he disarmed and it's, him. It's, he disarmed, right, exactly. Um, I, I think what's interesting, too, is obviously, yeah, I'm no scholar, but um, there's different versions where, you know, in some, it's uh, Beowulf doesn't use any weapons because Grendel's skin cannot be penetrated by the weapons anyways. And in other interpretations, Beowulf chooses not to use weapons because he because Beowulf is so strong himself, he wants it to be a fair fight. Oh, wow. He's like Sergeant Slaughter from G.I. Joe. Yeah. No exactly. weapons. <laughs> yeah. But with a Swedish accent. <laughs> I, now, see, now I'm going to start my fanfic about how Sergeant Slaughter is descended from Beowulf. <laughs> <laughs> and Beowulf can put together Ikea furniture like a monk. <laughs> he doesn't even break a sweat. Oh my God. Nope. <clears throat> and he uses no tools. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm grateful that you started with a creature that is, looks like a man, but is something other than man. And because he like, look like a man <laughs> or a person, human. Um, <laughs> I chose for my first one, the unman from C.S. Lewis's book, Paralandra. Mm -hmm. Now you're familiar with this or no? I know you've read Out of the Silent Planet. Uh, right. So I, I, I haven't read the other ones yet. So okay. reveal me. So to, for those who haven't read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, and, and this is mine to have. I'm not trying to put this on anybody else, but it's my favorite three books ever written. I've, I've read them probably 20 times since like 1995. Um, and listen to the audiobooks. I don't know how many times. I, I find immense comfort in that in that this this fantasy sort of um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but made for grown ups with a science fiction bend to it. And in yeah. space, in space, yes, and and yes, guess what? It's Jesus in space because it's Lewis. So let's just put that. We know you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me it's Frankenstein's monster. You don't have to tell me that Aslan is Christ. I know. But in, in the space trilogy, in the first book, our, our main character, Ransom, goes to the planet Mars, and he me, me, finds out about these things called the Eldils, which are basically angels, and, and uh, like the, the archons of all the different planets, which are called Oyarsas. And in the second book, he goes to the planet Venus, and this time, the, the Eldils take him. He's not kidnapped and brought there by force. Like he's, he's now in league with the Eldils, and they're like, hey, look, it's a big problem on Venus. We need your help. And Venus, it turns out, is the next Garden of Eden. 
and it's called Paralandra. So he goes there, and there's no people. There's just one woman, this this naked green woman, and the whole place is a paradise. It's it's literally like the Garden of Eden. But he he puts his own cool spin. One of the things I love about Lewis is like how he does his world building and really makes you feel like you're in a place. Um, so it's the whole world is just water, and the land masses are like these floating mats covered with trees that just move around the waves. And the one thing the green woman's not allowed to do is go to the fixed land. There's one island that doesn't move. She's not allowed to go there. There's your there's your tree of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. And Ransom is sent because the dark Eldil, the one from Earth, the silent planet, is there too. And he was he has brought Weston the scientist from the first book. Remember mm. uh, Weston, the guy who made mm -hmm. the spaceship and kidnapped Ransom? Mm -hmm. And so Weston doesn't know it yet. He just knows that, like, I'm being helped by these things that he calls the macrobes. We have microbes, they're little tiny microorganisms that affect our biology. Well, these are bigger than us. They're called, ma he calls them macrobes, which is a perfectly scientific way to talk about, like, cosmic creatures, right? Mm. Um, and then at one point, while he's in a philosophical argument with Ransom, he says, I call the power entirely into myself. I am going to be the force of, of bringing humanity into the future. And when he says that, all of a sudden he just he like gets slapped in the face by some force and falls down. And he gets up and he says, Ransom, for God's sake, don't let him do it. And then he drops dead. And then his eyes open again. And it ain't less than no more. And it's, it's literally he's possessed by the devil, right? But the way Lewis describes what is somebody... that the dark El, yes, yes, the, the okay. dark Eldil, yes, the, yeah. the the dark Eldil from Thulcandra, Earth, the silent planet. Mm. So, when when Weston went to Mars, he broke this sort of um, cosmic, um, oh, what do you call it, the siege line around Earth. Like the Eldils couldn't come to Earth, but now they can because Weston broke the siege line. But that also means that the dark Eldil or Satan can now go out to the other worlds. And so he's gone, he's going to Paralander because he wants to corrupt it the same way he corrupted earth. And so it's just ransom, this naked language specialist on this planet of uh, paradise up against Satan in a husky scientist's body. Right. And which sounds like it's going to be, Oh God, it's gonna be a whole bunch of conversation and Lewis philosophizing, which it is. And it's all wonderful. But the way he describes the unman, which is what he, what, what uh, ransom takes to calling Weston once he's possessed is so good. So the way he discovers the unman, cause like he thinks, he thinks Weston is dead and he just leaves his body. He's like, all right, he's dead. I'm go back and talk more with the green lady. But then he wakes up one morning and remember, this is paradise. This is a place where blood has never been shed. There's no animals eating each other. There's no violence. It's like, try to imagine like pure innocence. And Ransom comes across a little frog with its torso all ripped open. Little tiny frog laying on the ground. And Lewis does this magnificent job of explaining the horror of seeing the first murder in paradise, right? And then, is it okay if I read a passage from the book? Yeah, please. Okay. So he follows, he finds more of these frogs and he's just horrified. He sees all these little damaged frogs. Some of them are not dead yet. They're like limping along and he's just in, he's, he's trying to like put them out of their misery, but he's just a naked man in paradise. He, he doesn't have any tools. Right. So it's like, he t starts to describe, like it took a lot longer than he wished it would have, you know, but then he turns a, he turns a corner in the wood and he sees Weston hunched over one of the frogs. And now he's, he looks like a dead man and his, he's got these long metallic fingernails now, but he's just like a middle-aged scholar. But this is where it gets good is when Ransom, he says, uh, he looks at Weston. Um, it looked at Ransom in silence and at last began to smile. We have all often spoken, Ransom himself had often spoken, of a devilish smile. Now he realized that he had never taken the word seriously. The smile was not bitter, nor raging, nor, in any other ordinary sense, sinister. It was not even mocking. It seemed to summon Ransom with horrible naivete of welcome into the world of its own pleasures, as if all men were at, were at one in those pleasures, and if they were the most, and as if they were the most natural thing in the world, and no dispute could ever have occurred about them. It was not furtive nor ashamed. It had nothing of the conspirator in it. It did not defy goodness. It ignored it to the point of annihilation. Ransom perceived that he had never before seen anything but half-hearted and uneasy attempts at evil. This creature was wholehearted. The extremity of its evil had passed beyond all struggle into some state which bore a horrible similarity to innocence. It was beyond vice as the lady was beyond virtue. And that kind of thing, like this, he's not... He's not the prince of darkness. He's 
malice itself, which has a sort of like childish innocence to it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the other thing is that the knights on Paralander are just jet black because he has, it, because Lewis did a little bit of research and he no, he noticed that Venus is completely covered in clouds, which means there's no sunlight. And mm-hmm. that figures into the mythology of the planet and everything. But what it means is that when the sun goes down, it's just like jet black. There's no light whatsoever. And the unmanned will just sit next to Ransom and just go, Ransom, Ransom. And until Ransom will say like, what? And he'll say, nothing. And then, it's, it's, and then as soon as Ransom starts to go back to sleep, he goes, Ransom, Ransom. Like, so there's no, there's no cruelty to childish or juvenile any malice is available to this thing and it's never done with any kind of like sardonic smile it's like a, like he said it's like an innocent glee and it's evil so Oof. he's I one of chills. the and I, I as i was thinking about this i was like you know like most of the monsters i like have that sense of the uncanny about them like yeah i like big scary lizard creatures and, and like you know um i just watched uh, an irish horror film called the hollow which i really enjoyed which had all sorts of like weird takes on banshees they looked kind of like orcs from lord of the rings mm-hmm. um but when it's a person and there's just something off about them like that that gets me way way worse um and I will say the, the the final confrontation between Ransom and the Unman is it once you realize the way he's going to conclude it, you're like, oh, that's that's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> it's really good. It's not like a battle of wits or I think it's like it's literally a fist fight between two middle aged men in paradise. Uh, and, and it goes on forever. <laughs> I had read out of the silent planet um, several months ago. And so I need to, I need to, and I, I enjoyed it immensely. So mm. I need to, I need to continue on with the other, the other two books for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love all three. They're, they're three very different books, but they're connected all through the character of Ransom. So some people call it the Ransom trilogy because the third book takes place entirely on earth. So it's not really a space adventure, but yeah, the Unman is, I think a, a, a really frightening villain. Oof. I'm going to lighten it up a little bit uh, after that Uh, (laughs) because my next monster, you know, we, my next monster is not an evil monster at all. Um, Definitely the first two have been monsters, but you know, here on monster market, we just sort of, we define monster really broadly. It's sort of any, any creature from uh, folklore, mythology, all that kind of stuff. But I want to talk about something uh, fairly pleasant, I guess. Although maybe I don't know. Anyways, I'm talking about the Swan May. Mm. Now, this is a creature that um, I will get to sort of a specific, um, a specific version of the Swan May. But uh, for those who don't know, the idea of the Swan May or the Swan Maiden is a a, a concept that is ubiquitous there's so many tales so many legends um really across the globe we see similar uh stories in all kinds of cultures but this is at its core a woman who can turn into a swan hence the term swan maiden or swan may uh through the use of a magical cloak or garment and the story usually goes that there is a young man walking through the woods at night and he sees a woman bathing and he notices this garment and on the side of the pond or wherever she's bathing and he steals it. And so she he, he won't give it back unless she agrees to be his wife. And she does. And they live together and, um, you know, he keeps the cloak hidden. Usually they have children. And uh, usually the story ends with uh, the children will usually inadvertently either find the, the, the garment or lead the mother to the garment. She will take it, turn back into a swan and leave forever. Mm. There's also variations where uh, sometimes the young it's the young man's mother who finds and hides the the garment so that her her son will have a wife. You know, this 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 creature is also related. We also see stories of 
the selkie, which is a similar creature, although mm. uh, instead of a swan, it's a seal. And then in our first episode about mermaids, I talked about the marrow in which uh, the the female marrow uh, is, you know, very attractive and will have a red cap that allows her to swim and breathe underwater. And if you steal this cap, then she can't swim or breathe underwater and she can become your wife. Anyways, so that's that's the typical story. The other version, um, you know, for example, we know Swan Lake where a girl is turned into a swan, usually by an evil wizard, something like that. So lots of stories, lots of variations on that theme. Mm. But since we're talking about specific books, we're talking about uh, uh, specific literature, I want to talk about a fantasy story that was started in 1953 by Paul Anderson, who is a very well-known sci-fi fantasy author uh, called Three Hearts and Three Lions. Mm. So Three Hearts, Three Lions, uh, it's about a Danish man named Holger Carlson, who is, at the time, he is fighting against the Nazis, and he gets shot. And when he wakes up, he wakes up in this parallel fantasy magical universe, which, like, is Earth, but, like, a thousand years in the past, but, like... There's fairies and elves, all of that kind of stuff. So one of the characters that he ends up meeting in the story is a swan may named Eleonora. And what I love about Eleonora in this story is that um, Anderson takes the concept of the swan may and he subverts it. So she's described as, um, you know, Obviously, she is a very attractive woman, but she's described as being, you know, like tan skin, uh, like she she's an attractive woman, but she's an attractive woman that clearly lives outside. You know, she's not sort of pale up in a tower, unattainable kind of mm. woman. Um, and she's described as having, you know, like a garment of of white feathers it's it's a little unclear in the story as to whether it's clothing as to whether it's a garment or whether it's like part of her body like it's it's i don't i I don't remember being very clear one of the subversions is that uh alienora is pursuing holger rather than like the other way around and holger keeps rebuffing her because yeah i think he even says of course it's written at the time but he (laughs) I think he refers to her as a sweet kid, like, hey, you're a sweet kid. Mm. Um, but he 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 rebuffs her advances because he knows he's trying to get back home. So he's like, what future could we have? So, you know, she's not sort of the prize in 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 the book. Uh, the other thing is she is she has a ton of agency in this book. So. She transforms into a swan, and not only does she use that to, you know, go scouting ahead and things like that, but anytime the character, the group of characters in the book get into a fight, she's right in there. And as most of us know, swans are vicious. And Paul Anderson <laughs> makes it clear in the book that she turns into a swan, and she is fighting as a swan. She's She is dive bombing, all this kind of stuff. So I think she's a really great fun character in the book uh you know like she she's she's a love interest but she's not like a wilting sort of like oh all i want to do is get married kind of thing she's a love interest who could turn into kihar from watership down (laughs) yes pretty much pretty much yeah she's she is the story's kihar Um, (laughs) that's awesome yeah yeah um I will say just by way of sort of a little bit of criticism of the book, he writes some of the characters. Uh, so there's Eleonora and then there's also a dwarf that he meets and and he writes them speaking in like this heavily accented dialogue, which I have to say for me, it it's sort of had diminishing returns when I found myself like, uh, 
sometimes the dialogue would really slow me down because I was reading it and trying to figure out what was being said. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, you know? so yeah, yeah, it was like it, you, you had to like sort of like phonetically sound it out to figure out what they were saying. Right. It was it yeah. like, I, I think I, I appreciate what he was trying to do by yeah. showing like, hey, these characters, they're from a different time, a different all this kind of stuff. Um, but it, I feel like it became a little bit of a barrier. Mm. And it would probably be a different thing if you were hearing it, but to try to read it. Um, mm-hmm. That said, all in all, um, I would say the book is good. I wouldn't say it's great. I would. It, it's short. Um, but one of the reasons why this book, you, you'll often find this book um, being spoken about is... Jersey, are you familiar at all with something called Appendix N? I don't think so. So Appendix N is 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 a list of books in the original publications of Dungeons and Dragons where oh. they said, "Hey, here are a list of resources that we used that influenced us in creating this game. If you want to seek these books out, if you want to seek these, you know, legends and mythologies out oh that's awesome yeah and and paul anderson's work is in there all over the place one of which is three hearts and three lions so the reason i bring that up is because this version of the swan may is absolutely the version that is in dungeons and dragons as a as a creature just like 100 mm. percent whole cloth from oh that's there. cool when um, did when it, did when did you discover that when did I discover that it's like the character in Dungeons and Dragons is the same one from that book? Like at what point in your journey as a D and D uh, player, did you find that out? Oh, I, I don't know. It wasn't that long ago. Like I would say like within the last five years or so, cause I read this book probably two years ago. Okay. And um, just as sort of like through the side door, part of what, sort of piqued my interest was in addition to the Swan May, um, the version, the Dungeons and Dragons version of the troll is also taken from this book. Oh. So this is the book where the idea of like trolls regenerating, which hmm. if you play Dungeons and Dragons, that's always like the big thing about trolls. Trolls are um, in Dungeons and Dragons, you know, they're not like riddly under the bridge dwellers or they're not, you know, like elf quest trolls or, or, you know, miners, things like that. They're much more monstrous and their key element is that they regenerate. And that concept comes directly from this book. They fight this troll and they find out that's like, Hey, I hack this troll and then it heals up like nothing happened. Mm. So, you know, I think that this book, um, like I said, I it's not a bad book. I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm dismissing the book because I did enjoy it. There are a lot. There's a lot of things that I enjoyed about it, um, and I think in addition to sort of seeing how it influenced Gary Gygax, you know, the things that were that he drew from this book to put into Dungeons and Dragons. Um, is interesting as sort of a historical record as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's something that's like worth thinking about is like D and D is such a developed thing now, but there right. was a time where it was just like a handful of people just like borrowing from their influences to <laughs> turn this thing to what it is. Right? And the cool thing about the appendix N is there are several people, um, there are people on Instagram. There are people who do blogs and stuff where it's like they're doing the thing where they're going through it book by book, you know, like reading everything. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool that they acknowledged that back in the day. I can't. No, imagine, for sure. Yeah. I can't imagine Hasbro doing that now because now it's just like steel, steel, steel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at least back then it was like, hey, we're stealing, but we're telling you who we're stealing from. <laughs> so you can go steal it yourself. <laughs> yeah, there's something a little bit more like indie developer kind of attitude about that, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to go off on like a whole tangent, but like uh, they've even talked about, you know, even in there how 
a lot of the idea about, you know, the different planes and Dungeons and Dragons and astral travel and stuff came from Gary Gygax and uh, Tim Kask being huge fans of Doctor Strange. Oh, wow. And so, you know, it's all it's all in there. But I, I think also what I like about it is the the being upfront about influences and being upfront that nothing is created out of whole cloth. So anyway, so that's the Swan May and, mm. um, you know, kind of from fairy tale version uh, where she's sort of a little bit helpless. She's not really like a protagonist. She's just sort of whatever uh, to this Paul Anderson version, uh, which then gets adopted into the Dungeons and Dragons version. I've heard some other versions of the story too, where the man will take her swan outfit and burn it in order to keep her forever. And the moment he does that, she's like, oh my gosh, I was five minutes away from becoming your wife forever. Now I have to go. And she leaves and then he has to go on quest to find her. Um, if anybody wants to follow up on this, like Robert Bly has a whole bunch of like lectures about like the psychological profile of that kind of fairy tale. Um, Interesting. Cause I, I also did uh, come across, there are some versions where some variations where she'll find, she, she'll find the suit She'll fly away, but she'll tell the husband where she's going. And it's like, mm. if you can find me, you know, yeah. I'll come back to you. But usually she flies somewhere so like insurmountable. Yeah. Uh, if I if I remember right, the ones I heard, it was like the the land of nine times nine, which is like basically supposed to mean Russia or something like that. I it's yeah. been a while since I've listened to the talks on it, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, she she never just is like, I'm going to my sister's house. Right, always... right. <laughs> I'm going to literally like a mythical place that's so far away, you can't believe how far away it is. You're going to need to Right, like for. if you really want me to be your wife, you're going to have to go on yeah. a mythical quest. Yep. Jersey, you and I both, uh, we've written some stories. We make the books. We, we, we make the books that make the world sing. Um, <laughs> Barry Lan- Manilow kids look it up <laughs> but we don't make the books that make the money <laughs> no 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 we're both you know it's 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 quite the curse to be good at something that makes absolutely no money yeah it's it's <laughs> we we really hit the jackpot in terms of uh, life choices <laughs> <laughs> we have we have like a really uh I would say a demonstrable mastery over something that only a tiny bit of people care about. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, somebody, I, there was a saxophone player who was talking about, I, I don't remember who it was, but um, he was being interviewed and he was asked about Kenny G. Mm. And he was like, how do other saxophone players feel about Kenny G? And he was like, oh, we hate him. And he was like, oh, <laughs> why? Because he's, because he's like kind of, like mainstream or whatever. And it was like, no, we hate him because how many saxophone players do you know? None. Like it's just Kenny G. Like there's, there's no, (laughs) it's like you can have one at a time. (laughs) And right now Kenny G is it. That's it. The rest of us are just up the crick until the next Kenny G comes along. Won't be any of us though. No, no. (laughs) man. I want to be the Kenny G of storytelling. What does that mean though? (laughs) It means that people they'll, they'll conjure your name during PBS pledge drives. <laughs> That's what. <Ooh. laughs> yeah. um, but Zach, we both make stories with monsters in them, and so I thought it'd be fun if we during the break did a little bit of uh, recommending our own material by talking about some of the monsters we've created. Okay. I, I want to hear yours first. I want to see what monster because you made you've made a lot of monsters, bro. So. <laughs> I mean, you have, you, you've got a rich yeah. world of monsters. So well, I, which... I love monsters. I love monsters more than people. I love monsters so much. <laughs> well, I, that, that makes me feel like you're sort of leading me somewhere though. No, no, no. I, I just, I just know that you, I'm, I'm was expressing my curiosity because I know you have a lot of choices. I guess I do. Well, I was thinking about, because I've been working on, uh, the, remastered uh broxo pages Mm -hmm. i was thinking about migo a lot so Mm. you know migo the snow beast in broxo who's sort of combination of a 
a bear and a cat, but he's got a horn. Um, Cause I've always been obsessed with just like throwing something weird in a design, right? So like he could have just been a white bear that is no dismissing of, of Boulder who was a white bear. Mm. Um, but I'm talking about sort of in creating a quote unquote monster. Uh, he could have been a bear. He could have been a cat. He could have been a bear cat. Um, but instead I made him a bear cat with a horn. And I think my obsession with like a single horn actually comes from Venger from Dungeons and Dragons. Oh yeah. I see that. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Cause I love that design so much. And as a kid, that design haunted me. And I know in an interview I saw when they were, so if, if you don't know in the eighties Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, the main villain is a character named Venger who has just one horn on the side of his head, one huge curved horn. And I saw in an interview where they were talking about designing the characters and how I can't, I'm, I can't remember his name. Sorry, but, uh, the person who did the character designs for that show, he did this design and they loved it so much that even though it's a bad design for animation because he's, mm. he's not symmetrical. Right. So, you know, you can't just sort of like flip the cell, like you can't just flip him around willy nilly like you can most other characters. Mm -hmm. um, but that the design was just so inspired that they said, screw it, We're, we'll we'll go with it. And we just have to make sure that the horn is always on the right side. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So, you know. So you should say, I, what, OK, so the, the Migo is from Broxo, which Migo we can is get from Broxo. Yep. Which we can read on your Patreon. Yes. As I'm remastering it, uh, I'm special editioning it. Uh, so I added Boba Fett. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So Migo is Broxo's um, friend, mount, dog, nanny. Mm. Uh, he is the monster who took care of Broxo as a, as a little kid up until, you know, we get up to the story. And that's part of why he's one of my favorite kinds of monsters. He's the scary, ferocious monster that's actually just, uh, he's a nanny. Mm. You like, know, like, he's... Like Shiegra from The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. Exactly. Or Snarf. Yeah. Or Snarf. <laughs> well, yes. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't get both of us started on Snarf. <laughs> um, and the name Migo, so... There was a uh, there was a movie that came out not too long ago about like abominable snowmen. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it was, it it was called, like, like like called like Littlefoot or Smallfoot. Maybe something like that. It was like I a stop know. motion stop motion film. Yeah. No, no, no. This no. The oh. one I'm thinking of was CG. It wasn't. Mm. It might have been like a DreamWorks. Uh, see, I oh uh, yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Yes. This is how so immensely uh, wonderful that movie must have been because I, it's, it seems forgettable. But the only reason that I remember it is because they named their main character Migo, who is a big uh, snow monster. Who, you know, again, kind of a Yeti. Yeah. A little more Yeti-like. Um, now, I remember that actually makes sense. Initially, I was like, whoa, snow beast called Migo. But then I remembered that I got the name Migo because there's like a Tibetan word for like a snow person that is something like Migoi. Oh. And so I think that that's where I got it. So that's probably where they got it as well. So it's fine. But my my Migo wore it better. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I I had dogs growing up. And I had cats growing up. I have cats now, no dogs. But I love, I love four-legged animal friends. And yes, as a child, I absolutely fantasized of like, especially after seeing Star Wars. I'm like, oh my gosh, Chewbacca's like a big dog who's like your best friend. And he could mm -hmm. like rip people's arms off if they're mean. Like, mm -hmm. I want that. I want to go to school with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like Falcor, right? When Falcor, yeah. when Falcor buzzes the bullies in, uh, yes. in, in the Never Ending Story. story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's incredibly cathartic. It's super satisfying. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Or, you know, a little bit of Ludo from Labyrinths. I was just thinking of him too. Yeah. Like big, sweet guy who's immensely powerful and he will, he will, me- he will mess up your day. <laughs> <laughs> By calling rocks. <laughs> By calling rocks. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I'm a huge fan of that kind of character type, and so yeah, I I I was wondering if you're gonna choose him, and then yeah, it, it's interesting to hear about the 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 single horn thing too, and mm. where that that origin comes from. Yeah, that's cool. Sometimes I worry, like when I'm designing characters or creatures, and I give them a single horn, I'm like, ah, oh, my am, am I is this a crutch? Am I relying on this too much? And then I think to myself, no, it's not a crutch. It's a signature. There you go. Yes, you just love what you love. Mm-hmm. Just keep loving what you love. Tell me about uh, some of your monsters and some of the stuff that you're. Wor- I know what you're working on, but I yeah. I well, I mean, I the work is done. It's it's going to be in stores in September 2024. So depending on when this episode is released, you'll either be up for pre order or wherever you get books. Um, and that the book, book being is, the inscrutable Doctor Bear in the case of the Two Faced Statue, which is a very cute, spooky story. Um, and the monster I want to talk about is the one that is based on one of my greatest childhood fears, which is it's a creature called the living doll. And it's this, uh, it, if I were to describe the visuals, I would say, take Hello Kitty and mix her with Annabelle. And then you've got the living doll. And so Hello, it, Annabelle. Hello, Annabelle. But don't look her in the eye because she, according to the lore in the story, she is possessed by a demon spirit. And its evil stare creates fear, confusion, and hostility, particularly in children. Mm. And once under the living doll's influence, there is no evil act unavailable to you. So mm. the trick is never look her in the eyes. But she does the doll thing where her head can turn around in all directions. So it's kind of mm. hard to avoid her gaze. But it's just, it's a little white cat in a Victorian sort of like, uh, or like, uh, like early settler's dress but with the eyes gouged out and all the cracks coming out of the eye sockets and everything. So, but um, yeah, I, I have, I have a big aversion to ventriloquist dummies and mannequins. Um, I wouldn't say a fear of them, but as a child, I was absolutely t- petrified of them. But now it's just like, if I see them, they make me uncomfortable. Like, ugh, ugh. but, and I want you to know mm-hmm. all of the times that I have not sent you <laughs> posts or YouTube clip or something yeah. of a scary ventriloquist doll. So, Oh my gosh. Thank you. I just want to say you're welcome. <laughs> what a gift that you relented in torturing me. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. I didn't abuse you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. I could have scared you, but I didn't. Oh, I, the, I, I, what thanks do I get? <laughs> I had one friend actually, I, I sent them uh, a PDF copy of one of my books, like a review copy, and he sent it back like annotated with notes on the things that he wanted me to like look at. And I swear to God, he put in, in one of the pages, inserted a picture of ventriloquist dummy. So I'm flipping through, flipping through and boom. And I was like, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he ambushed you. No, I take it back. The story was, it was his book. I was reviewing his book to give him, I was doing him a favor. I was doing a nice thing for him, and he did that to me. Oh, I, I got to remind him of that uh, next time I see him. Oh, my gosh. Well, I think it's time to cross someone off the Christmas list. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, people should go read Brock. So if, if you're a fan of this kind of stuff, and then you can also go read The Inscrutable Dr. Bear, which is a very kind of like lighthearted, silly, but also creepy and spooky story when's the when is it up for pre-order it's up for pre-order now at the time of this recording well all right everybody pause this go pre-order it we'll be here when you get back it's uh, dr bear is spelled uh b-a-e-r the german spelling of bear so i can get the domain name (laughs) and also if you're not following jersey on instagram or on jersey's patreon as well uh you can see just like all the cool stuff that he's doing for this book you know so many people just make a book I mean, I don't want to say just make a book because so many people make a book and put it out in the world and that's it. But you are turning this into, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, can we talk about like the stuff that you're making for the book? Oh, yeah. 
It's an making, experience that goes beyond just reading this book. Well, I'm, I'm a big sucker for in-world objects. So when I was a kid and the He-Man sword came out in stores, you could actually buy the He-Man sword. I'm like, I got He-Man sword, you know? So I'm making uh, little ceramic talismanic objects that ha are uh, it sort of covered with the, the mystical language of the book. There's like a mystical alphabet that, that wizards have to speak in order to do spells. And yeah, so I'm making like actual real ceramic, you know, I have a kiln, you know, firing these things at 2000 degrees, making little necklaces and earrings and charms out of them that I'm going to be selling alongside of the book so you can get like pieces of the world and there's like lore to each one like oh these these objects are typically found you know by demons deep and, and so on and so forth so yeah you know you know what we need we hmm. need a modern we need to bring back the satanic panic <laughs> so that you will sell more books you by think so? angry mothers angry mothers going on to 60 minutes talking <laughs> about these talismans <laughs> That yeah. summon demons that kids can buy. I actually, I, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor this this section, but like I actually recorded a microcast on my Patreon. It's only with my Patreon supporters, but it, it explains how I'm thinking about that. Like in terms of, I'm trying to be very careful how I word the language. So I'm never explicitly saying this is magic, right? Mm -hmm. Out of respect for that kind of well-meaning, but paranoid parent who, who thinks that, <laughs> that little piece of clay made by a middle-aged man in Columbus, Ohio can summon the devil. <laughs> well, I'm glad you can use the word respect. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that we have to live and let live, we all got to get along somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up. Okay. You're up. Okay. My next one is going to be kind of a like everybody knows this character so i don't feel like i'm bringing anything new to this except maybe my interpretation and what i what, what the character makes me feel uh, as as someone who consumes fantasy and monster stories but i want to talk about baba yaga mm. uh, and i checked and you and ben have not talked about baba yaga yet so this no is... now but i think i think ben's gonna be uh mad at you well good he should have yeah. been here so he could talk about baba yaga <laughs> somebody, somebody shouldn't have gone off on a world trip to do, do a book. You know, he should have been staying here and doing an important podcast with his best friend. Yeah, exactly. And now, you, <laughs> and now you don't get to talk about Baba Yaga, Jersey. Please, yoink. Actually, proceed. There's, there's a whole bunch of Babas he could talk about besides Baba Yaga. There's Baba Gaia. There's even a Baba Jersey. But anyway, Baba Booey. Baba <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Zach. That was the zackiest Zach who ever zacked just now. <laughs> All right. So Baba Yaga. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm i not a scholar on the character, but I've been reading and listening to a lot about the character. And um, because I want to put her in my next Dr. Bear story. And, uh, and I have a cat named Baba Yaga that I love very much. But the reason I even named the cat Baba Yaga is that for me, I'll put the headline first, is like, the stories that I've read that she appears in, like Vasilisa the Beautiful, my takeaway is she is, as they say, the ambiguous witch. She's neither good nor evil, although she leans towards nasty. She eats children and everything. But, <laughs> but if, if only the can... ones who deserve it, <laughs> <laughs> like Yvonne, you're getting at Vasilisa. Well, you can just do a bunch <laughs> of slave labor for me. But, but like if, if you can meet her where she's at, and if you can respect where she's coming from in a way and you can, you know, pass her tests, she'll give you what you asked for, but it's also what you needed that you didn't know you needed. And that I find fascinating about her. Like she's, she's, she's an earth mother kind of character. And so she's, um, got a sort of deeper sort of subconscious wisdom it's conscious in her but it's subconscious in us and what i mean is is how fam i don't know how familiar you are with the story of vasilisa the beautiful um not very okay well then i can tell it um so it's it's your standard cinderella story little girl dad and mom uh mom is dying and as mom's dying, she gives Vasilisa this little doll. And she says, like, you know, like, whenever you're in trouble, if you're overwhelmed by something, just give the doll a little bit of food, a little bit of water, and then go to sleep. And the doll will take care of things for you. And then the, 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 I, the thing they always say is there's wisdom in the morning. Trust the doll. And mom dies. Dad remarries. 
to a nasty woman with two nasty daughters, right? And the t- the, the oh. then the dad goes away or he dies or whatever. So now Vasilisa, this adorable little Russian girl, is trapped with this horrible uh, stepmother and mean stepsisters, right? And one of the things that Vasilisa has to do as a as one of her many many unpleasant chores is keep the fires lit in the house. Because if the fires go out, they they would have to go to Baba Yaga to get more fire. And the sisters put out all the fires and like, ah, oh, now you got to go to Baba Yaga. You got to get some fire for us. And, this is, and I'm telling one of the many versions of Vasilisa the beautiful, by the way. So, but they know they're sending her off to get eaten, right? It's like, oh, we finally got rid of that terrible, terrible stepdaughter that we don't like, right? Vasilisa goes to the house and Baba Yaga says, well, like, well I give, oh, by the way, Baba Yaga's house is surrounded by a fence of skulls that are on fire. <laughs> the most metal house you've ever seen in your entire life, right? She's just a really big Ghost Rider fan. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, yes, and Danny catches her stepbrother. But so <laughs> she, she says like, okay, well, like, Vasily's like, can I have some fire? She's like, well, if you do this impossible task, like you gotta like sift through all of this wheat and chaff overnight. And Vasily's like, oh my God, I can't do it. And so she gives a little water to the doll, a little food to the doll. The doll says, hey, don't worry about it. There's wisdom in the morning, go to sleep. She wakes up, the job is done. Rumple still skin style, right? And Bobby Yaga's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. Well, now you got to do a harder one. It's some other task, like, like you know, uh, weaving like an impossible tapestry. I forget. Some, some kind of thing that women were expected to do in those days in order to be a good wife, that kind of like uh, homely chore. And she says, but if you don't finish by morning, I'm going to eat you, right? And so the girl gives water and food to the doll. Same thing. Dal does the task, and Bobby is like, I can't believe it. You're amazing. This sucks. I wanted to eat you so bad. Uh, and Bobby is like thinking, like, maybe there's another way I can get around this to eat you. And then Bobby Yaga asks, like, how did you do this? And the girl says, my mother gave me a blessing that allows me to do these things. And, and there's one thing Bobby Yaga can't stand is like having anything that's blessed in her house. She's like, well, you get out of here. And here's here's the fire you asked for. She hands her one of the flaming skulls, right? So I was like, okay, cool, problem solved. I'm gonna go home to light all the the lights in the house and go back to my miserable life of of being mistreated by people. And as she's approaching the house, the stepsisters and the mom come out and they're like, "What? How are you still alive?" And then they're like, "Shush, shush, shush." Oh, so good to see you, Vasilisa. I see you have some fire there. She holds up the skull. It opens up and it incinerates the mother and the stepsisters. Right? Hell yeah. <laughs> Boom, yes, baby. and that's and that's where the Stan Bush music starts playing. You got the touch, <laughs> but but what I love about that is that Vasilisa didn't do it. Baba Yaga put in a special trap. They're saying like, yeah, I know why you're here, kid. You got a wretch of a stepmother and two nasty stepsisters. Here's the fire you asked for, but I also embedded it with what you need, right? Mm-hmm. And what you need, you need those people out of the picture, right? So she's both a terrifying and scary creature, right? She's trying to figure out how can I get around this whole problem I have where I keep making deals with this kid and what I really want to do is I want to eat her. Mm -hmm. But then when she realizes, okay, well, you're blessed. Now I can't eat you and I want you out of my house. Here's what you wanted. And since you did such a good job, I put in this special secret gift in there too. So that's what one of the things she represents for me as a character, like this kind of implacable unreadable, inscrutable kind of earth wisdom of the subconscious that if you show up and you, you, you say what you need, but then also trust the subconscious, that's what the doll is. The doll says, go to sleep, right? Wisdom's mm-hmm. in the morning. Let your subconscious do this stuff for you and, and then come back and you know it'll be okay. And maybe you'll even be more equipped than you thought when you go back into the world of, of, of all the different challenges that you have to face, right? Is that the main, that's not, so what am I trying to say? That's not sort of like the, the main Baba Yaga story, right? Like in other words, what I'm trying to say is there are many Baba Yaga stories. Like there's almost like a continuity, right? There, there are a ton of different Baba Yaga stories depending, uh, and and also they differ depending on the region. So like in Mm -hmm. Russia, it's this way in Poland, it's that way. Belarus, uh, there's all sorts of different interpretations of the character. I'm not, I haven't made a map of all of them, um, but Vasilisa the Beautiful is one of the most famous stories about her. But like then there's stories about her and Ivan, and her relationship with Ivan is very different. She is not hospitable, and she doesn't cut deals. She's like, I'm going to eat you now. Is that Jack Frost? Yes, that 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 uh, Rus- Russian Finnish film. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, ja- yeah, which I I love unironically. I you can find the the non MST3K version on YouTube, 
and I adore that movie. Um, I was wondering if you were going to bring that up because I also, I, I love the, so, okay. So it's an episode of MST3K. It's a very good episode of MST3K, it but is. it's also one of those movies that I agree. I, I unironically also, uh, enjoy, enjoy that movie. And cause Bobby Yaga is played by a man. Mm-hmm. He's like, I don't know. He's like some famous like Finnish comedian, right? Or I something. think so. Yeah. I think that's yeah. right. And I mean, and I skipped over all the stuff that I think most people know is the house on chicken legs. She rides around in a mortar and like covers her tracks with a broom and uses a pestle to push her along. Um, you know, she's got the whole old crone thing going on. I think another thing I like about her too is just the idea of um, there's a great podcast episode of an, a show called Deviant Women where they spend about two hours talking about Baba Yaga. And they, they, they do spend some time talking about like how it's the power of embracing crondom, meaning it's like our, our culture tends to celebrate youth and the mm-hmm. idea of like, well, a woman's not so good if she's not like this fertile, fecund, you know. If she's not this, breedable breedable thing right and like but no but there's like something even deeper and more profound in the the crone uh clarissa pinkola estes has a series of books called the dangerous old woman and i love them they're so good i strongly recommend you listen to the audiobooks if you can um it talks all about this and like yeah so i've, I've been on like a real witch tear lately i just really am enjoying listening to the kind of empowerment that the image of the witch gives to people who present as as women the visual of baba yaga is iconic like that there mm-hmm. is that very you know there, if you're going to draw baba yaga which you are but mm-hmm. if if one is to to draw baba yaga or if one is to depict baba yaga there are certain notes you have to hit mm-hmm. yeah. i think for it to be baba yaga mm-hmm. um and where it's got that goofy quality to it, which you know, yeah. which we both love, right? Like it's it's that that blurring of the line between scary and goofy, yeah, um, yeah. That it's just it's great, and and you know, I think maybe that that kind of can describe Baba Yaga herself, where it's like like you said, she's scary, but there's also you know uh, uh, there can be a little bit of maybe slapstick. I don't know. Well, yeah, especially in that Jack Frost movie, there's that whole bit where he, like Yvonne is spanking her after pulling her out of the oven. <laughs> <laughs> you did a short reading. I'm going to do a short reading as well, if you'll permit cool. me. Please. <clears throat> and I'm sure this is something that uh, you have heard before, and I'm sure most of our listeners are, have heard before, but if not, then uh, here you go. "'Twas Brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All Mimsy were the Borgoves, and the Momraths outgrabe. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the Jubjub bird, and shun the frumious Bandersnatch." He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the mangzome for he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulky wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack and left it dead, and with its head he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, kalu kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the Borogoves and the Momraths outgrabe. Mm. Have you heard that poem before? Yes, that is, isn't that from, isn't that Lewis Carroll? That is Lewis Carroll, who 
wrote this in 1855, but published it in his sequel to Alice in Wonderland, known Mm. as Through the Looking Glass in 1871. Mm. So, Something that's interesting is even when he originally wrote this poem, so so this is largely considered one of the uh, foremost poems using nonsense, right? Mm. So he invents all of these words that he puts in there. And, you know, Shakespeare used nonsense as well. So, he, so Lewis Carroll is not the first to use nonsense, obviously, but this is one of the most famous nonsense English poems. And he even originally wrote it to sort of uh, like be presented as like a strange old text that was found. And in the book, uh, Alice actually finds it, but it's written backwards. Mm. She can't read it. So she has to hold it up to a mirror Mm. to be able to read it. And that's where the, the, that's where uh, uh, how she reads the Jabberwocky poem. Um, so this poem actually is the origin of a lot of English words that at the time were nonsense, but now are are actual words in the dictionary. Words like chortle, no, oh. galumph, <laughs> gimbal, mm. gyre, and burble. So those are all mm-hmm. words that you can find that have meaning uh, that were just, uh, at the time, nonsense words. Now, the Jabberwocky, um, again, obviously this scary kind of creature. And while the poem itself doesn't describe the creature that much, other than, you know, we know that it has jaws that bite and claws that catch, and we know that it has uh, eyes of flame, Really what we sort of see the Jabberwocky as comes from the illustration of John Tenniel, who was a political cartoonist of the day who illustrated uh, the original Alice story. And then apparently he was kind of reluctant about illustrating this one, but he did it anyways. And um, if you haven't seen his drawing of the Jabberwocky, um, you have seen his drawing of the Jabberwocky. I'm almost 90% sure that that you have. I mean, it's basically like clip art at this point. But something that I think is really interesting is that um, despite sort of the frightening but also kind of whimsical nature, again, of this sort of nonsense kind of poem, um, you have to remember that in the Victorian era, there is this really blossoming interest or or interest obsession i don't know in paleontology and biology and 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 things like that so when you look at his drawing it's actually constructed and rendered pretty realistically you know and, and people have noted that it almost starts to look kind of dinosaur like and this was just as paleontology was really starting to take off and dinosaurs mm. were starting to, um, you know, real study was starting to to figure out how dinosaurs were put together and things like that. And the Jabberwocky sort of has a lot of those, those elements to it. Mm. So uh, kind of a quick one, but uh, yeah, you know, again, I think the Jabberwocky is um, definitely in the canon of English literature. Yeah. What, I, what I like about it, too, is the poetry of it doesn't tell you explicitly what it is, which gives it more of a dreamlike quality, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the the idea of it's summoning all of the sort of like child's, you know, late night in the bedroom kind of terror of what's out there. I don't know, but it's something. And I know it's yeah. worse than I could possibly imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that's the kind of vibe also, I get from that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we also don't know anything about the jub jub bird or the bandersnatch. All we mm-hmm. know is avoid them at all costs. Right. right. Uh, mom rafts. We don't know what mom rafts are. Um, also just to sort of tie it together. Uh, uh, you know, I mentioned that, you know, some of these English words that, that 
have their origin in this poem. Um, but there's also a couple of words that have their origin in this poem that while they aren't um, official English words, we find them in lots of places. The main one being Vorpal. Mm. Um, so anyone who has seen Monty Python, anyone who has, again, played Dungeons and Dragons or has played um, other fantasy games will understand the term Vorpal. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that is fun is that in Dungeons and Dragons originally, so a Vorpal sword was a sword that, you know, had extreme sharpness. And if you rolled a 20, the sword goes snicker snack and it be <laughs> and it automatically beheads uh, its foe. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and, and, I, oh, and there's even, so like, you know, I was talking about, you know, people studying Beowulf. Uh, a lot of study has been put on this too. And some, Lewis Carroll addressed some of it, but even things like Snickersnack, there was like a particular kind of knife um, that has a name that's sort of similar to that. So it's like, while the words are nonsense, sometimes they are, you know, sometimes they do have a pedigree from, from something else. Uh, and certainly, you know, words like gimbal and gyre about, you know, a gimbal is a thing that moves around and a gyre, it's like a gyroscope, right? Something that spins and moves and oh. things like that. Yeah. Yep. It's almost like language is a living thing. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> So that is the Jabberwocky. The Jabberwocky. Nice. Oh, I will. I also want to say, so in the 80s, there was a mini series. Did you ever see this Alice in Wonderland mini series from the oh. 80s? It had like celebrities in it. I don't think so. Oh, like it had like Carol Channing as the white queen and she turns into a sheep and it's really terrifying. Oh, weird. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen this? Oh, no, my God. no. Oh, you got to check this out. Anyways, um, there's a scene with the Jabberwocky, and it's it legit was frightening as a child. Cool. They do the thing that they did in Labyrinth where she thinks she's home. Alice mm. thinks she's home. And then she's like, hey, where is everybody? How come nobody's at home? And then the Jabberwocky, she reads the poem, and the Jabberwocky shows up. And it's pretty scary. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But not as scary as the scene with Carol Channing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Carol Channing. Oh, man. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I am a big fan of children's media that is genuinely frightening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, me too. <laughs> All right, Jersey, take us home. All right, take it us home. Uh, I want to talk about the crumpled linen monster from M.R. James's story, A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad. Ooh. Are you familiar with this? Not even a little. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, cool. I was hoping I would bring some something that would be unique to you. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with, and I, I'm not saying this to be obnoxious. Somebody got me on my case about this recently. I said, I don't know how familiar you are with this. And they're like, oh, well. And I was like, but I'm just saying, I'm not assuming that anything that I like is something other people like. Yeah, all right, Egghead. <laughs> Keep going. Right? I, it's not lording anything over to say like, hey, I'm just going to assume that maybe this is something weird that I, I'm into. But um, I've been reading the ghost Have stories. Have you read of this or are you ignorant to it? <laughs> That says more about you than it says about me. Um, no, but uh, I've been reading M.R. James ghost stories, and I got a collection called Ghost Stories of an Antiquary. And when, when did he write these? He wrote these a long time ago. Um, oh, the publication date is 2021, but when were the stories written? Um, I don't know. Long time ago. Like, like I, I think, I want to say like the late 1800s, but I could be wrong. But this is like, I think one of his most famous stories, which is a whistle and I'll come, for you, come to you, my lad, which is the story of this uptight scholar who goes on holiday, you know, like you do to the, to the shore because you have money and he's staying in like this uh, vacation cottage sort of hotel place and he's playing bridge with this uh, burly colonel who is in the room upstairs and 
and they're walking along the beach and, and he, a friend of his asks him like, hey, while you're there, there used to be a bunch of Templars who had like, uh, I forget what it's called. They had like a, a sort of like a, a kind of a church that Templars hang on. It has a specific name. It's like a, a preceptory, I think is what it's called. It's like, there's some old ruins there that you should check out and like, let me know if you find anything cool. I want to, I'm going to, another scholar might want to come up and look at it. So he goes and he finds it and he sees like there's some rubble there, but then there's like a little niche, a little hole, and he puts his hand in there and he starts feeling around. And he finds a little metal cylinder that he pulls out and he's like, oh, that's interesting. He takes it back to his room and upon investigation, he sees that it's a whistle. And, at, and, and I should say, after he takes the, the cylinder and starts walking back to the hotel, he notices there's a person on the beach about like two, three hundred yards down who's running full tilt toward him but they're not getting any closer. And he's like, that's interesting. Well, time to go to dinner. There's a lot of moments in the story where like the narrator describes something that we look at it and our, our horror brains are going like, that's a monster. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but the, 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 uh, the uptight Scott was like, Oh, hi, time for tea. You know, so he's, yeah, I, I don't, mm -hmm. he doesn't think anything of it. Don't and so go he in there. So he take after dinner, he's, he's sitting in his room with this, this, what he discovers is a, like, it looks like a dog whistle. Um, and it's got an, an inscription engraved on it. And the inscription reads, F-L-A-F-U-R-B-I-S-F-L-E. And on the other side is a little Latin sentence that I won't try to pronounce. I'll just give you the translation because he knows enough to translate the second line. And it says, well, he's, a um, scholar. he's a scholar. And it says, who is this who is coming? But the, the editor of this book says, but the other side is Latin too. And the character doesn't know it. And it actually reads, Thief, you will blow, you will weep. So he's 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 digging the dirt out of it, and he carefully puts it in a little piece of paper so as not to make his room messy. And then he uh, and then he he goes to the window to throw the dirt out, and he sees there's just like a figure standing out in the street across the hotel in the middle of the night. And he's like, oh, people sure do stay up late. And he goes back and he sits down and blows on the whistle and it makes a very charming sound that just sounds like it's very soft, but it sounds like it goes on forever. And the moment he blows it, a giant gust of wind hits the window to his room and he thinks he sees the flapping of a white bird's wing out the window, right? And he's like, oh, how interesting. And it just keeps going on like this for a while, right? But then the next morning he gets up to go golfing with his friend, the colonel, and the maid's like, um, oh, hey, you know, we made both of the beds in your room. And he's like, I only slept in one bed. And she's like, well, the other bed was pretty messed up. It looks like somebody had a rough night's sleep in it. He's like, no, I, I must have, you know, made it un untidy when I was unpacking my things, right? Um, and then he's coming back from golfing. And a little boy comes running up to him in the curl. He's terrified. It's like, there was a white figure in the window of the hotel waving to me. And I didn't like it. And they see, look up at the window he's talking about. It's his window. Right? He's like, oh, how interesting. So they go into the room <laughs> and they see that the sheets are all messed up on the bed again. He's like, well, the maid must not have made the bed after all, right? Um, and it keeps going on like this where he's like, he's like, oh, how curious, you know? But you're like, mm. it's a monster, right? Um, and it turns out, you know, he, he's late at, staying up reading one night. And when he lights a match to light the candle, he's just scurrying away from his bed. He's like, oh, it must be mice. But finally, on this uh, critical night, when the moon is shining through the window, he hears a rustling coming from that bed, and this form rises. He jumps out of the bed because he's scared, because now, now he knows there's something in the room with him, and he sees this figure made out of the sheets that's shuffling around and feeling with its hands, because he can't see it. Yeah, and it's like patting the bed where he was, and he realizes it can't see, but it can hear and it can feel. And as it's moving around the room, like a Nazgul trying to find him, one of the sheets strikes his face and he lets out an involuntary scream and it lunges for him. And he's leaning and he's about to fall out of the window and he's screaming with all of his heart and the colonel comes down and when the moment he opens the door, the sheets collapse. And then the next morning, they burn the sheets and the colonel spends the night in his room with him. Um... And that's really how it ends. Oh, and the colonel takes the whistle and throws it into the sea. But but that's how, like, it, a lot of M.R. James's ghost stories end kind of like... And then they like, kiss. They <laughs> <laughs> You've been reading my Tumblr. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought I, I thought of the privacy settings on. <laughs> 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 and it, it's a very violent love that the two of them share mm -hmm. but, but um, oh colonel <laughs> <laughs> but, but um 
but what I love about this is like you never find out what the damn thing is. You don't know. Mm. It, like all you see, uh, what, what does he say? He says something like, "When the the creature's head gets into the moonlight, he sees that it's uh, a hideous face of crumpled linen." And wow. and so you don't get any backstory. You don't get any resolution. It's just like he had this cursed whistle. He blew on it like a fool, and this thing came to get him. Right. A lot of the stories are like that. And what I what I love is the the ambiguity, which feels more haunting than giving me the Michael Myers backstory. I don't need to know who Michael Myers is. I just need to hear Detective Loomis say he's evil. Okay, I got it. Now I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, that's part of what makes things scary is is yeah. is when you don't know yeah. what it is or when you don't see the monster. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, There's cool. the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, I was just going to say it, it reminded me of when you said like, you know, a face of crumpled li- linen. Have you ever seen um, the Halloween decorations that sometimes people make mm. where it's like they take old sheets or burlap and it's like you crumple it up and you kind of spray it with stuff so that it sticks. And then mm-hmm. you can kind of make this like face but it's yeah. Out of, it's that's like what I imagine. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I if if you dig the the ghost stories, uh, Mr. James's stuff is pretty great. And I will say, if you go to YouTube, um, there's a bunch of audio versions of his stories read by Michael Hordern, who I I understand was the actor who played the the main character of this story in like a BBC reenactment or adaptation. But I know him as the voice narrator of the old '70s Paddington Bear stop motion animated shows. Oh. So super when charming. Was MR James, when was MR James writing these? I want to say in the late 1800s. Let me see if I can find that okay. information while I'm talking with you. Um, but 1893 something. Um, so yeah. like kind of a contemporary of like Poe. Around that, yeah, I think so. And like, mm. I think his stories. Um, my understanding. Um, my apologies, listeners in the UK. But um, I understand that like these stories get read around Christmas time a lot, and they 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 made like TV uh, specials out of like ghost stories for Christmas. Um, I I I'm only recently started getting into this stuff, so um, God bless the British and their Christmas ghost stories. I love it. <laughs> it's because they I'm, don't really have Halloween, right? Oh, is that what it is? Uh, we we've got that catharsis through every October, so we don't need it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but very cool. I I like that. I can and it's something that you can just like you can imagine, right? Like oh just yeah. the twisted sheets and, and it's like, dude, I was sleeping in you. Like that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there there's another one I read of his where it was like another thing where he like peek he creeps the door open, looks through, and he just sees like a human form underneath the sheets that's writhing uncontrollably and he shuts the door. Right? And that's the climax <laughs> of the story, right? <laughs> oh man, I would love to see a version of I mean, I haven't read it obviously, but like I I'm imagining just such a bumbling like I don't know, but like very proper British gentle, like opening the door and seeing a writhing body and just being like, Oh, my apologies. And, you know, closing the door again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, how very interesting. Uh, let's see. Okay. So yeah, it looks like it was like 1911 is when his second book, uh, more ghost stories of an antiquary, a thin ghost and others came out in 1919 and a warning to the curious is 1925. So it was the early 20th. So he was probably contemporary of, uh, Lovecraft. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. But. Yeah. All right. Well, so, uh, now we come to the part of the show where we, choose our favorite monster from the others list okay uh so you had the unman you had mm-hmm. the linen monster and you mm-hmm. had baba booey um, <laughs> that's right <laughs> <sighs> it's between the linen monster you know what i found the description 
of the unman that you read pretty chilling like this idea of this is such a void this is such an evil that it's not even an evil that that the human brain can really comprehend right you know right like it's it's like it's like if hitler was like was like a southern madam like y'all come on in here we're murdering you know (laughs) (laughs) it's like this joyful like this is just what we do for fun right yeah yeah (laughs) Or like, yeah, like I'm imagining like, you know, the whole point of like the yin yang is that, you know, in darkness, there's always a little bit of light Mm -hmm. and in, you know, light, there's always a little bit of dark, but here it's like, nope, there's no. Yeah. This is just corruption itself. Yeah. 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 I'm going to pick the unman. Also, what a cool name. Yeah. Unman. I love it so much. Oh, I, I don't know which of the three books I've read the most, but my money's on Paralandra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick the unman. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go. Yeah, I mean the Swan May was the one that I felt really? the most. Yeah, the most curiosity about following up more on. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, yes, I like the scary monsters as you know, as evidenced by the the characters that I picked. But mm-hmm. I also like the characters that point to kind of strange dream imagery that probably points to something deeper in the human experience, right? Like, like where did that idea come from? Like, well, she takes off her swan jacket and she's a person Puts the swan jacket back on. She's a swan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it, it must come from some, something deep in the psyche of, you know, a woman being ultimately kind of like an unattainable beauty like like mm. something that is so like uh, um almost divine that mm. the only way that you could possess it is through force or deception right like mm. like this this thing is so beautiful and so perfect that there's no way she would be my wife of her own volition mm. because because I am but a man <laughs> Right. So, so I wonder if, I wonder if, if some of that plays into that trope somehow. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, you, I think you've, you've initiated uh, a deep dive for me. I want to be looking into like the, the, the the symbol language of that character. Um, Yeah. I think, I think you would enjoy three hearts, three lions. Like I said, it's, it's a pretty quick read. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not, it's not out of the silent, silent planet. Um, I've heard that, uh, I mean, he's written so, Paul Anderson's written so many books, but I've heard that, uh, the broken sword is a much better fantasy mm. book that he wrote. And I, I have a copy. I haven't started it yet. Um, but three hearts, three lions, I enjoyed it. And I have to say it didn't, um, if I had to give it the highest praise, I would say it doesn't go where you think it's going to go, or it certainly, it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, you have that to look forward to. Mm. All right. Well, so those were our literary monsters. So now we <laughs> seem very educated and academic and, uh, you know, yeah. yes, I'm going to go analyze uh, a stanza <laughs> of poetry now. <laughs> oh, Jersey, uh, where can people find you? Uh, I, the place I hope they'll go if, if, if you're still listening and if I haven't chased you away from Zach's wonderful podcast, sorry, Ben, um, you could go to <laughs> drbear.com, D O C T O R B A E R.com. That'll take you to the page where you can learn all about my book that's coming out. Uh, I've wanted to make this book for going on 20 years and I put a lot of my own, um, I, I process a lot of my childhood through this, this book about talking horses and bears and pigs. Um, so there's, I, I feel like there's real stuff in it. Frogs and, and dogs and bears and chickens and chickens things. and things. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I, I was hoping to shoot a video with you where you could say, I just want to put a video on you, like sitting at a table with a uh, piece of paper saying, dear dogs and bears and chickens and things is, <laughs> is graphic novel is September <laughs> is time. <It's> time. <laughs> <laughs> I will absolutely do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, drbear.com uh, in the the case of the Two-Faced Statue, a 248-page full-color middle-grade graphic novel coming out from Iron Circus Comics in September of 2024. Um, it, I, I will say, I mean, at the risk of being immodest, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I, can, I can attest to that. Um, and, Thanks, um, um, you know, just 
a glimpse into a larger world that I think we're going to see more of. Well, we have seen more of, but uh, so, you know, this is part of like the, the, the Drozd cinematic universe. Kind and of. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that always excites me. Yeah. I've done other books about people from this world. Yes. All right. And uh, so with that, I will just say uh, Jersey, thank you so much uh, for filling in for Ben while he's, I don't know, whatever, whatever he's doing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a laugh to hang out with you, Zach. So thank you. Anytime, every time, whenever. And I will leave you today by saying, remember, peoples is peoples. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Hey, everyone. David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there. <laughs>